are back with a number, another episode of Rappin' with Reef Bomb. I'm your host, Keith Burkelhammer, and our guest on the show tonight is Brandon McHenry. Hey, Brandon, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. So, Brandon, here's a little uh, background about Brandon. Brandon began reefing in 2012 and has built and maintained seven personal reef tanks from 14 to 100 and 150 gallons, as well as six displays in a public aquarium that showcase a wide variety of plants and animals, including Caribbean, stony corals, seagrasses, sponges, gorgonians, and farm-raised game fish. He received his master's degree from Florida Atlantic University, focusing on marine microbiology, and is now a research technician at FAU Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute investigating the nutritional requirements of aquacultured Florida pompano. Did I pronounce that right or pompano? Pompano. Pompano. I, I, yeah. I butchered it twice. <laughs> and his 40-gallon reef tank, which is sitting right behind him and is looking awesome, was recently named the Reef to Reef um, Reef of the Month, an award that was started up again. So that's a big honor there, uh, Brandon. And, and we have an exclusive interview here with with this newly decorated tank. So, uh, Branham, yeah, man, welcome to the show. I'm psyched to have you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. John Reaver, Vermont, man, thank you so much for that super chat right off the bat. Wow. Well, welcome, everybody. I see Great Bearded Reef is there, and and uh, John Reaver, Vermont, I just talked about, uh, mentioned Star City Reef. Paula Powell, welcome back. Josh uh, Outram, uh, howdy. Algae Warrior, Moderator, Luann is in the house so folks i um i encourage everybody to ask questions we uh we're going to dig into to brandon's tank i know there was uh, a lot of um information in the uh in the reef to reef profile the showcase there so we'll uh we'll cover some of that stuff but perhaps we'll dig even deeper into it but uh brandon uh, brandon i always like to start off the show by asking my guests how they got started in the uh in the hobby so what's your uh what's your story there uh let's see uh so born and raised in florida so i've kind of always been around the ocean um so i uh did lots of fishing lots of boating kayaking snorkeling all that uh and i had really just always loved everything underneath uh all the corals all the fish it was always uh just real exciting to me and so i kind of always had that interest and then um when i was younger kind of in middle school uh, my dad had a 55 gallon freshwater tank uh which i had liked i enjoyed that and getting to see that and then towards my senior year of high school i kind of started to think i, I think i want a reef tank uh, and so I started by just doing a ton of research, uh, on reef to reef and reef central. And I just read through, uh, so many different articles and so many different threads. And then once I graduated from high school, I was going to FAU, uh, for my undergraduate and I just decided, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm finally going to do it. And so I went to a local fish store that was right by, um, the campus and I asked my dad for the old 55 gallon tank and I said can I turn this into a reef tank and he said sure uh, and then I put it together it was real simple it was just live rock it was uh, a canister filter a two bulb t5 and I just threw some coral in there uh, and it didn't last very long um, because on one of my trips to the fish store I passed a 90 gallon tank and I'm like well this is better uh, so I brought that home and that's kind of what really started it, uh, was that 90 gallon. Then I started up the filtration. Uh, I focused more on the lights and after that, uh, the addiction kind of grew from there. And at one point, uh, and it's a little ridiculous looking back at it now, um, I had three reef tanks going in my parents' uh, house in my bedroom, uh, at the time I had a 14, I had a 29 and I had a 90 gallon. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my room was, was very bright most of the day. <laughs> Did you have to pay for part of that electricity bill there, or did your parents let that slide? Uh, they let that slide. Uh, I convinced them that it wasn't a huge draw uh, on the electric bill. So how, how did those, uh, you said the, uh, the first tank didn't last too long in terms of um, what it, it, it crashed. How was the, um, how, how was your... No, I, 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 I upgraded. Oh, you upgraded. I didn't want that, that one anymore. Yeah, that, it was only a handful of months. I maybe had it for like six months, and I'm like, I'm, I'm ready for 
for doing this for real. So you already graduated up and, and, and upgraded after a few months. Well, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty impressive. You know, a lot of folks, uh, first tank is, uh, can, can tend to be a disaster with a lot of, you know, first timer type of, um, um, problems that, uh, can set in. And I don't know, I think in, in terms of what I heard you say, doing a lot of the research was the right way to go about doing it. You got to really do the homework and do a lot of reading. And I don't think a lot of people, you know, in, in today's uh, hobby do do that sort of, um, you know, information gathering. It, it, it can also be kind of confusing too, because you did mention you're, you're um, you know, reading a lot of threads on the uh, forums. And sometimes those things can be confusing for, for people that um, are just starting out on the hobby. But yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think there, you know, the, the internet is, is a gift and a curse. I think for a lot of things, there's a ton of information out there. Not all of it is accurate. Not all of it uh, reflects what, you know, you may be doing in your own personal reef tank, but you know, something that I try to tell people when they ask me for advice is, you know, think about it critically and think, does this make sense? How many people said this? Did they provide any proof that, you know, what you're reading is actually true or accurate and then decide, is this going to work for my tank? And I think that's kind of the way I approached it from the get go was knowing, all right, I'm not going to have a $10,000 reef tank right now. It's my first tank. So I'm going to take advice from people who are in a similar situation as me. So we just had a couple of comments in the chat, just uh, trying to <clears throat> figure out who you are on Reef to Reef, and your your handle is Florida Reef Keeper, right? On on R to R. On on Reef to Reef, it's just uh, Brandon McHenry. Brandon, on Instagram, okay. it's Florida Reef Keeper. Uh, Florida Reef Keeper. Well, just check out the Tank of the Month article, and you'll find Brandon on on Reef to Reef. So I think a a, um, a really good way to start digging into this, uh, Brandon. Brandon shot some video of the 40 gallon tank that uh was honored on reef to reef <clears throat> so i'm going to start rolling the um the uh, the video on that uh tank and it's pretty impressive very very impressive and and then once it comes up in the feed brand and if you can kind of like or even you could start talking about it now in terms of you know the setup and the corals and and we'll just um get more into the details after the video uh runs cool yeah, so uh, it's an innovative marine 40-gallon uh, tank. It's an all-in-one. Um, so, oh, there it is. Um, so this was something that I started uh, just over two years ago now, um, and it is oh, a little bit of a challenge. Uh, like I had mentioned before, um, I had never done an all-in-one reef tank before. Like I had mentioned, I kind of came off of my 150-gallon uh, SPS tank, and I needed a little bit of a smaller system. So I set this one up. Um, and what really drew me to the tank was, I mean, uh, innovative Marines, a, a very well-built, uh, system. So I really liked that. Um, but it was small, it was contained. I didn't need a whole lot of extra stuff. Um, so it worked really well for me by figuring out, uh, how to use an all-in-one reef tank was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you don't have the space to put the equipment that you want. You don't have the ability to maintain it, uh, necessarily the same way. You can't just open up your cabin and go under there and, um, you know, pull out your skimmer. Um, so it's a little bit more work involved, but it turned out really well. Um, and so, A lot of people ask me kind of when things started to take off the way that they have. uh, And I'd say within the last year has been good. But within the last six months, uh, I think, has really been uh, where things kind of exploded. Um, And I've mentioned this before, but I think a lot of that came down to uh, starting the tank with uh, dry rock. Um, First of all, it was a a tank upgrade from a small bio cube I had running. So everything got bumped over the same day uh, with dry rock. And so I did have a fair few challenges there. Um, But I think it took a little while to just mature and kind of hit that sweet spot uh, that I was so used to with running all my previous tanks with live rock. Um, But after about the the two year mark, uh, things really just started to take off. Um, And one thing that I really like about this tank um, that I thought about a little bit more critically uh, this go around were corals that contrast each other nicely, corals that will grow into nice shapes uh, and look good under daylight. Um, I'm I'm very much a full spectrum lighting guy. I'm not super crazy about the blue look. Uh, And so to be able to pick corals that pop under that, uh, as well as fluoresce uh, when you have the blue going, uh, 
really, really made me like this tank a whole lot more. And I've kind of found uh, which corals I think I would keep again, uh, which corals maybe not um, in a future tank. But uh, I didn't go anything super fancy uh, with the coral list. Um, most of them are no-namers, uh, a couple from ORA, a couple from Worldwide Corals. But other than that, uh, it's just pretty basic stuff. But I like the natural look. I want to see just a few large colonies of coral uh, all kind of creating a little little slice of the ocean. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, you, you've got some, some very um, classic, standard, um, kind of um, not fancy corals like the, the bird's nest. You know, the pink bird's nest is, uh, is a coral that I used to, uh, to love to keep in both the pink and the green. You know, the problem that I had with the bird's nest corals is that it just grew so fast. But mm -hmm. there are certain varieties of the bird's nest that uh, that don't grow as fast. But um, yeah, it's just a very natural looking tank, and and um, you know, very well done, very well done, man. Thank you. Um, we got a question from John Reef of Vermont. Can you speak about all the fish you have in there? Uh, so I have. They're, they're all small, but I do have a, a decent number of fish. I think for a forty gallon tank, I have seven fish in there. Um, I have the yellowfin uh, fairy wrasse. I have two yellow lion gobies. I have a Bengay cardinal, uh, and then I have a tail spot blenny and a psychedelic uh, mandarin. Do you have any um, any desire to go beyond that list um, for that particular tank? Or do you think that's kind of um, where you're at, or you could have just kind of save it for the uh, for the upgrade down the road? I would love to have more fish. Uh, I'm just having a very hard time picking what would work in the system. Um, having a fish that's small enough and for me peaceful enough um i've i've done the clowns i've done you know the chromies and, and things like that and i've just i've gotten tired watching them you know get get nasty with one another it's not something i want to really watch in my tank um so i'm very picky about it now but i would like to add more fish uh particularly water column fish i really like fish that are moving around and active uh in the tank so if anybody has any suggestions for uh, small, peaceful fish uh, <laughs> for a 40-gallon tank, you go ahead and, and shout them out. So you um, you mentioned that this is like an all-in-one, so you don't have a sump, right? There's no sump for that tank? There is no sump for this tank. It's got uh, the chambers in the back, uh, and so it's got the two overflow chambers, one of which uh, is where I have my skimmer. The other one is where I have a ball of Kato. Uh, and then there's just kind of two baffles uh, that go through there, and I just have some some uh, carbon passively in a media bag there. And then in the center um, is the uh, return section. Uh, you um, so you mentioned Cato. Do you, do you dose anything for the Cato to help um, the Cato grow? Uh, I don't, um, but I am very rigorous about my water changes. Uh, I do five gallons every weekend, so there's always uh, trace elements in there from that. And then I also have started using um, the uh, the BRS and the, and the Tropic Marin um, dosing method. I was using ESV before, but during the uh, the pandemic, I had a hard time getting hold of it. Yeah. Uh, so then I switched over because I felt like that was a pretty close comparison. Um, I don't go tra crazy on trace elements, but I like the idea of knowing that I am supplementing them, at least to keep everything balanced. Yeah, so um, you're using the BRS um, parts uh, A and B. Is that what you're... Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, you know, so another thing that um, I'm curious about is, uh, you, you know, you mentioned um, um, in, in terms of the nutrients and the Cato and all that sort of thing. What, what are your... Um, parameters at in terms of nitrate and phosphate for the tank uh nitrate is 0.2 uh it's barely color uh, on the test kit and then i use salifert for that one and then the phosphate is uh, 0.03 with the hanna ultra low range phosphorus i i really prefer lower nutrients um not in the sense of stripping the tank i, I advise against stripping the tank uh, I just, I like the heavy in, heavy out. So I want to feed my fish right now. I mean, they get five feedings a day, uh, four from pellets and then my frozen mix at night. Um, and then I just like to export it real heavy so that nothing really builds up in the tank. And I just feel that that's the, the best way to have a healthy tank with growing animals, growing coral, and then avoid the nuisance issues. 
point two. That's pretty low in terms of nitrate. What um, <clears throat> what do you attribute that to in terms of uh, you know you're, you you are using a skimmer in the uh, in the back of the tank you said, but you do you think it's just with the water changes? And do you just keep the uh, the sand bed very clean, uh, free of detritus? What um, what do you attribute to the um, to the very low nutrients? I mean, you're certainly feeding your fish enough. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that's impacting the um, the nitrates is the sand bed. Um, I am, I'm a sand guy. I'm not really a bare bottom, uh, type of guy. So I like to have, you know, a three inch sand bed. I think it does wonders, uh, for taking out nitrate. Um, and I'm, I'm very meticulous about it. So because it's small, my water change consists of five gallons worth of vacuuming the sand bed every week. Do you have a, um, a cleanup crew in there as well? Like any, um, anything that's working the sand or are you pretty much the cleanup crew with the sand bed? I mean, I may have a few of those nasarius uh, snails in there still, but I'm pretty much the uh, the worker of the sand. My my cleanup crew has uh, kind of dwindled as there's been less space for things to grow. Do you find it tough with the um you know with the rock and and what have you in terms of getting to all parts of the sand bed in terms of cleaning it? Is is that a challenge in your tank, or is it laid out in a way that um, it's not um, too hard to kind of get to the spots to siphon what you need to siphon? It's pretty good. Um, I, uh, the only areas I have real issue getting um, are directly beneath the rocks. Uh, and then I have this one kind of little archway that I can get most of each side of it, but I can't get really directly in the middle uh, of it. I will say now that um, the, uh, the bird's nest and the digi have grown towards the glass, uh, I'm having more issue uh, getting in those corners. But uh, for the most part, I can get uh, all three sides and a little bit underneath uh, some of the rocks with, with not too much trouble. Do you do anything in terms of um, trying to blow detritus off your, uh, you know, aquascape? Some some folks do that in terms of taking a little power head or a baster and, and blowing detritus, you know, off the rock. Is that something that you've done in the past or um, is that something you don't bother with? It's something I did in the past uh, back when there was more, you know, rock visible. Um I would go in there, not, I would just do it with my hand mostly. Um, I did go through a period, uh, probably about the one year mark. I had an explosion of like just mulm. It was, I, I actually, I took it to a, a microscope at work and looked at it. I mean, it was everything. It was diatoms, it was cyanobacteria, it was bacteria, it was all sorts of detritus, um, just hanging nasty under all the rocks and I would blow that continuously and eventually one day it just went away. Uh, and ever since then I haven't really needed to do it, but I mean, I keep the power heads fairly high, I think for a tank this size. I mean, I have two MP forties on about 40 or 50%. So, I mean, I kind of crank some water through here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's certainly some pretty good uh, circulation going through there. So we have a question from pa um, Paula Powell, what dry rock was used and what was the process to cycle it? It was um, carob sea life rock. They make a great light, uh, a great dry rock. I like all the different shapes that they had. Actually, funnily enough, I built the entire thing out of the arches. Uh, there's not a single boulder uh, coral in here, so it's all just a weird stack of archways. Um, but it worked. Um, in terms of cycling, like I said, I, I really didn't cycle anything. Um, I put live sand in there. I use the Carib C uh, special grade reef sand, which I think is like the perfect balance of fine enough to look nice and not look like crushed coral, but big enough to resist uh, the high amount of flow that I put through. Um, so I did that. I put the rock in there and I used 10 gallons of water from the old bio cube and threw everything in. Uh, and I was just super careful um, with the following weeks, just with keeping up with water changes. But I didn't really have too much of an issue with that. Um, my issues came more with, uh, you know, those those typical dry rock issues that you get, you know, as their tank kind of goes through those phases. Yeah, you know, we, we've talked a lot on the show about dry rock versus live rock, and I'm a big advocate of, of live rock, and, and so you and I are kind of on the same page with that sort of thing. I, I really believe in, the, you know, the, uh, the sponges and the biodiversity really gives you a leg up in terms of a, uh, a quicker cycle. But, um, you know... Listen, other folks have uh, success doing the uh, the dry rock method. It's it's not something that um, I had a great experience with, and it sounds like it was something that uh, wasn't a great experience for you. But um, you know, it's it's tough though because with the live rock not being as um, easy to get a hold of, 
and um, the dry rock being really easy to aquascape. And, and um, did, did you ever um, think about that in terms of the benefits of, of dry rock with this tank? Did, did you do an interesting aquascape? I mean, you know, right now looking at your tank, I can't tell what kind of aquascape it was, but you know, I've said this before also that if you do the, um, if you do the tank right and, and the corals grow in like they should, Really, um, the aquascape's not going to, in terms of fiddling with the aquascape, it's not going to make too much of a difference. Yes, it's going to make a difference in terms of creating a lot of areas for flow to go through and, and you know, all the NSA, uh, the negative space aquascape types of, um, you know, rock work are really, really cool to look at. But I don't dwell on aquascaping too much. I just want it to be, um, you know, functional and, and serve a purpose. What, what's your kind of philosophy on aquascaping? I think you hit, you hit the nail on the head with, uh, with function. Um, for me, it's, it's about function. Um, and so when I was thinking about this tank, I thought about some of the things that I wanted to see and grow moving forward. And I already, I know moving forward, whenever I eventually get into an upgrade, the things that I want to see. And for me, it's, I want to place corals in a way that they're going to grow into nice colonies. They're not really going to interact with each other too much. Uh, and, I think about the, what the finished product's going to look like. Um, I feel like the super decorative aquascapes that you do in the beginning, I mean, they're for your first year or two because it kind of looks cool. But like you said, once everything grows out into a full-blown reef, you don't necessarily see those same shapes that you saw before. You see the corals. So that's my goal. I want to think about it, where the tank's going to be in two, three years when it's full of coral. And so just giving things the space that they need to grow, know where I'm going to put flow, know where I'm going to want to access. Um, I, I mentioned this on um, my Ray for the Month article. I wish I went just a tad bit smaller on the aquascape because now I can't fit my hand down some of the sides of the tank and I've got corals that are growing out of the water. So like these are things that... I wasn't necessarily thinking about, I was just too jazzed up to get the tank up and going and build a quick aquascape. And I was like, all right, yes, we can, we can transfer everything. But yeah, think about the end game is really what, what I think is important, uh, especially with, with maintenance, you want to make sure that it's going to be easy. Uh, so once you get to the point where you really enjoy your tank, you're not frustrated every time you go in there to work on it. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, when, when I first started my, uh, reef tank, um, many, many, many years ago, I, um, I kind of went by the old rule of thumb back then to use two pounds of live rock per gallon of water. So it was like a brick wall <clears throat> in my, uh, my first reef tank and it looked pretty, pretty, um, well, it, it just didn't look like a natural reef and, and, and mm -hmm. it would just looked like, um, I don't know what, you know, it, it was a brick wall and it was not pretty. And then, uh, you know, the next tank that I had, I, I used less rock and, and then I, I started using, you know, like a pound, um, of rock per, um, per gallon. And, and, you know, it's just got less and less. And, you know, my new, uh, 225 gallon uh, tank, I've got a hundred pounds of live rock in there. So, and, and, um, you learn over time that less, mm -hmm. the less rock you can get away with, the better you just need the, um, you need room for the corals to grow and you got to kind of think a couple of years ahead, not necessarily, going for that instant gratification of a, um, of a tank that looks full, even though, um, you know, you're planting a lot of uh, corals in there. What, what's your philosophy in terms of, you know, adding corals at what point in time do you like to add corals to a new reef tank? Do you, um, are you the, the type that wants to get corals in as soon as possible? Or are you patient on that front? I am, I'm a, I'm a patient reefer, I think. Um, so, with this particular tank, I didn't necessarily have that luxury. I only had space to put one tank, so I just decided to make the transfer and, and deal with the consequences. Um, but I, I'm a big believer in coralin is good for coral. Uh, so I want to see a good amount of coralin coming onto the rocks and onto the glass uh, before I feel comfortable adding, at least when it comes to like stony corals and things like that. I want to see that uh, growing in the tank. Now, obviously that changes if you use dry rock or if you uh, use live rock or sand, no sand, those things change the timeline. Um, but for me, I want to see you know, big, big chunks of coral and starting to grow in the tank before I go and add, uh, any of the SPS coral. So, uh, we had a, a, a comment by algae warrior about the fish just, he, um, 
suggesting what about a fire fish for the tank? Those are really passive fish. Have, have you thought about a, uh, a fire fish? I have thought about fire fish, uh, and they are almost to the point where they are too skittish about everything, mm -hmm. at least in, in the ones that I've, I've had, I have had them before in some of my smaller tanks and just, I've had issues with scared to eat, scared when I stick my hand in there, obviously they're kind of prone to be jumpers in my experience too. So I really like them. Um, I, I especially the purple and the hell freaky, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I've just not had best luck with them. So let's, uh, let's talk about calcium and alkalinity supplementation. What, um, what are you doing for the tank at this point? You, you know, you mentioned, um, the BRS, right. In, in terms of the, uh, the two part, what, um, are you also dosing magnesium along with the two part or is it just, um, the calcium and alkalinity? Yes. So I have got, um, the bulk reef supply, calcium chloride and soda ash. I really like soda ash because I'm, I'm kind of strict about the pH, uh, of the tank. I, I do suffer with a lower pH. So I do everything in my power to keep it elevated as best I can. Um, so I do those two. And then I was doing, um, the magnesium chloride, but with the Tropic uh, Marin three-part, uh, the, the trace element balling package, there's enough magnesium in that part C uh, with the potassium to keep my levels where I'd like them, plus the water changes. Uh, and then the other big thing that I do is I am a huge fan of Kalkwasser. Uh, so I use that in my ATO at a full saturation. And then on top of that, I'm up to about a hundred, uh, 105 mils of each of the, the oh, two wow. parts. Yeah. That's a lot for that yeah. size tank. Are you, uh, thinking, oh, yeah. are you thinking about, uh, switching over to a calcium reactor at some point? Uh, not for this tank. Um, I'm, uh, I've, I've always liked the concept of calcium reactors, but I've always been just a tad bit intimidated, uh, by the idea of one. Um, and especially in a situation where I'm already kind of battling a lower pH, uh, I know that there can be even more depressed pH with a calcium reactor, but, um, maybe in a tank upgrade, I would do something like a calcium reactor. Cause from what I read, uh, what I've heard, once they're set up and tuned nicely, it's just a fantastic thing to have. Oh, you've never used a calcium reactor? No. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've, I've had, um, great luck with calcium reactors and, and, uh, yeah, you know, once you get them, um, um, you know, dialed in, it is pretty much like a set it and kind of forget it type of thing. And, you know, I mean, I, I got a, I got a much bigger tank than you, t well, two um, bigger tanks and, and, um, one of them I'm doing two part and I'm, you know, I'm dosing about 300 mLs of each part per day on, on my 187 gallon tank. And, you mm -hmm. know, I need to switch over to a calcium reactor cause it's like killing me in terms of the, uh, it, start, the yeah, it starts to get just cost prohibitive yeah. at that point. So I, I want to switch over, but you know, in terms of speaking about pH, I, um, I've talked about this before, but I put in an, an air exchange unit in my basement here. You know, I live in Vermont. Yes, I heard that. Yeah, and uh, it's definitely helped. It's definitely helped in terms of the pH. And, um, you know, I didn't have like a a, um, a problem with my pH in terms of it being too low. It was always like in the low, kind of like eight range. But um, mm -hmm. I, I avoided using a calcium reactor on my 187, uh, you know, gallon tank a few years ago because I got just I was concerned about the, um, the, you know, having the, the CO2 and, and lowering that pH. So whenever I do run a, um, a calcium reactor, I do use a, uh, you know, Kalkwasser as, um, you know, to help raise the pH. And I also have a, um, you know, a dual chamber calcium reactor to help kind of mm -hmm. absorb that, uh, that excess, um, um, CO2. But the, uh, the air exchange unit has definitely helped me, um, so what, what have you done to kind of like try to, and what, what, what pH levels have you uh, been seeing and what have you done to, besides the caulk washer to try to keep it elevated? Well, um, when I kind of went into the craze of, of, of looking at my pH, um, several months back, I, uh, I started testing it and I was hitting, you know, 7.7, 7.8, um, and, no higher than eight, um, at the end of the day. And obviously I live in Florida, so all the windows are typically locked up tight, uh, during, you know, most of the year. Uh, so what I started doing was I was already using calc. Um, so I continued with that. Um, I have a, actually two, uh, CO2 scrubbers. They're just kind of chained together, um, just to make sure that I don't ever have any lapse, uh, in the media. And then, um, 
I also added the Cato. So the Cato is actually relatively new. Um, for a very long time, I, I had no uh, no necessarily a need for it. Um, but I I love Cato. I love refugiums. It's it's a big thing of mine. So um, I took the opportunity and I put one in the back to help uh, absorb some of the CO2. And it's done pretty well. Um, I can get now a solid 8.2, um, eight, eight, two and a half uh, at the end of the day with all those things. Uh, I'll tell you this, this past week of cool weather and windows open, I can get eight, four, eight, five, uh, at the end of the day. And I can see in every single coral, better polyp extension. I mean, I already have great polyp extension, but I mean, I look at some and it's like, I need to take a shaver to them. <laughs> um, they, they just, they love it. And my, this past week alone, I went from, 88 uh, mils of each part up to 105. Wow. Well, there you go. Now I, you know I've that's seen. Yeah, it's drastic. Yeah, I've definitely seen uh, a lot of um, increased growth since I put in the air exchange unit. And um, it's interesting because uh, I was on, I joined the uh, the Boston Reef Keepers um, Society Club meeting last night on a uh, on a Zoom call. And we were talking and, and one of the uh, club members talked about, um, you know, what, you um, what his wife did in the room that he has his reef tank and she put a ton of plants in the, in the same room, mm -hmm. I guess. I don't know if she did this intentionally. I can't exactly recall the, uh, the story, but, um, there was a ton, a ton of plants were added to the room where the fish tank was in. And those plants really absorbed the, uh, you know, a lot of the CO2 in that room and, and the pH went up. So I guess that's another option to consider is like, put a whole ton of plants in the room with your fish tank to, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, uh, to help absorb any excess, uh, CO2. Um, I'm just trying to keep up with the chat here in terms of the, um, some of the questions and comments. Uh, one comment, um, is a good one that I saw in terms of the, um, who made this uh, comment here. I'm just looking through here. The, oh, um, Louis and Heidi 80 dry rock gets such a bad rap lacking biodiversity. So what's the best way to increase biodiversity? Do you have any, um, advice for anybody trying to increase the biodiversity of when, when using dry rock? Yeah. So, um, and I, and I'll also reference a, a, a thought from earlier about getting live rock. I know it's very tough. Um, and I know it's not accessible everywhere, but KP Aquatics uh, down in the Keys is, is a great company. I've gotten live rock um, from them before and it's aquacultured. So it's sustainable. It's in there for two years. So I was, I was talking to somebody today about it. You can, you know, cut a significant portion of your, you know, tanks maturity right out by using something that's already been in the water for two years. So, uh, if you are not afraid of pests, uh, not saying they have pests, but if that's like not one of your concerns, if you chose dry, dry rock for a different reason, um, you could always get some, some live rock rubble or a handful of pieces of live rock. Um, you know, depending on where you're sourcing your corals from, they're going to bring stuff in as well. They're going to bring bacteria. They're going to bring other microfauna in. So if you're getting them from, you know, an aquaculture place, a reputable place, I mean, you're going to bring some of that uh, in with you. And then I've heard really great reviews. I've never ordered from them before, but Indo-Pacific Sea Farms um, has a good mix of different worms, pods, uh, phyto. They've got, um, they call it like a live sand activator. Uh, and I'm sure that's just, you know, water from a sand bed and it's got bacteria and it and whatnot. Um, so bring in some things from nature that you can, uh, to try to increase the biodiversity. I'm a big proponent of sponges as well. Um, any kind of cryptic sponges you can get. I mean, that was one thing that I used to do um, back when, you know, live rock was a little easier to get a hold of uh, was I'd rummage through the live rock bins um, at a local fish store, reach down all the way to the bottom and find the ones with like the cryptic sponges on it mm. and bring that back and be like, I'll pay for the water, whatever, I'll keep them wet. Like, because I mean, sponges are just, are, they're really important in my opinion in a reef tank. So anything that you can do, to bring live stuff in, you know, bottled bacteria is, is, is one thing, but it's not the whole picture. You need the worms, you need the pods, you need, you know, the sponges, you need all these things to create, you know, a, an ecosystem. That's really what we're trying to do. So I really like those types of biodiversity as well. Well, I'll, um, I'll, um, I, I agree with you in terms of your endorsement of the KP Aquatics. I, I got a hundred pounds of, of live rock and started my um, my new tank with with the uh, with that stuff, and it just came in like 
some serious coralline algae, some um, a whole bunch of critters, some good, some not mm -hmm. so good. But I was able to kind of flush out the not so good ones by doing a dip in, in um, you know, high specific gravity water a few times to get them out of there. But, um, yep. you know, I'm, I'm, my tank is like coming up on five months old. I still don't have any corals in there. And, and, uh, but I've got a lot of coralline algae that's growing in that tank and, and it was seeded. It came seeded and, and the tank cycled in a week and I had fish in that yep. tank, you know, after a couple of weeks and, um, it, um, and, you know, knock on wood, really no, um, no major issues with the, uh, any problematic algae or anything like that. So I, I'm a fan of it. And, um, I, I, I agree totally. I think there's, um, there's things in, in the live rock that you can't get in a bottle, um, mm -hmm. that, that do make a big difference with the tank. And I think it accelerates it, but again, people do have success going the dry rock route, but um, you know, some good, good thoughts though, in, in terms of what they can add potentially to increase that biodiversity. Um, so a question popped up, um, before, and I was going to ask this question myself, but, uh, I think it was from, I can't see, uh, I'll, I'll see it in a second, but about lighting. So what's, what's, uh, what do you got yes. in terms of lighting the tank? Oh, so this was a this was a bit of a roller coaster uh, for me in terms of lighting. Um, when I first set up this tank, um, I actually didn't have the canopy on it, uh, so I was using a Radeon uh, Gen 4 XR15, um, and it's it's a great light, it's a beautiful light, and it really does you know wonders for making the coral pop. But I was coming off of you know T5s. I'm I'm a T5 guy, always have been, um, and I wasn't seeing what I like to see in my tank. Uh, so, got the canopy, uh, and I started with just putting a two bulb uh, retrofit next to the uh, or just alongside with the uh, the Radeon. Uh, didn't quite do it, and then I bumped the two bulb retrofit to a four bulb retrofit, and it was still not necessarily what I wanted. Uh, so I finally made the break uh, and went with the ATI Sun Power, um, and it was a fixture that I've been eyeing for I don't know however long I've been in the hobby because it's always been around. It's been a fantastic light, uh, and I always so my my past tanks I did retrofit, so I went for it. Uh, and it's just been, it's just been amazing. Um, so like I mentioned before, I'm kind of a full spectrum guy. Um, I really like the whiter look, uh, with just enough blue to give the corals some nice color. Um, but then not wash out the things like, you know, the pinks and the purples, um, that you kind of lose, uh, with overly blue tanks. Um, so I've played with the bulbs quite a bit, but what I've landed on right now, um, which is far uh, exceeded all of my expectations uh, was I've got now two uh, blue plus bulbs from ATI, three coral plus, uh, and then I have one Tropic 6500K. Uh, I know some people cringe at that bulb because um, of how yellow it is, uh, but it's fantastic for the pinks and the purples in particular. Um, and then I went and got a Reef Bright uh, Lumi Light strip. Uh, just to give that little bit of extra pop and a little bit of uh, dawn dusk effect. Uh, and out of all the bulb combos and everything I've done for lighting, this has by far uh, been my favorite. I think the corals look the best. Um, and they have fluorescence uh, all throughout the day while still showing, you know, their natural looking colors. Uh, and I'm also a kind of a, a heavy par uh, guy. Uh, I think that acros in particular uh, do best under you know real high par uh if you can get them up to that point uh so right now i think at the top of my tank i i haven't checked it in a very long time um but i'm probably topping six six fifty oh wow at the top of my tank wow. yeah the sand bed's like 350 so and that's before the lumi light so I, did, I i didn't really get that for par i just got it for a little bit of aesthetics but even if it adds 50 par then i'm probably topping almost 700 at the top of the tank so if, if, um, you know, when you eventually upgrade, do you think you're going to be sticking with T5s or would you entertain like a, uh, a hybrid type of approach with LEDs, you know, um, and, and T5s? I like the hybrid idea. Um, I kind of, I've used different versions of the hybrid idea in the past, but I just, I never found the right fit, uh, between the two. The fixture that I'm, that I would eye for an upgrade, uh, would be the power module, uh, from ATI. I, I love their fixtures and I want the T5s to kind of carry the weight 
uh, of the lighting, but I like the fact that it's got integrated LEDs and I can use that for a little bit of pop, a little bit of shimmer and then dawn dusk. I think I would absolutely do a hybrid situation um, in an upgrade. So Alex Correa is commenting that ATI gives way better distribution and much better spectrum than any LED in the U.S. I'm happy for you, Brandon. <laughs> Thank you. You know, when it comes to LEDs, when it comes to anything uh, in this hobby, I, I, I will tell everybody that you can be successful any method that you choose. There is no right. There is no wrong Different things work for different people, and it kind of depends on what your goals are. You know, there are plenty of people with spectacular LED tanks, uh, SPS dominant. Um, you know, like some of the ones that, I mean, like I said, full spectrum. I really like Sanjay's tank, um, but you look at his tank, he's got a ton of the radions up top. He cranks them up, hangs them high. Like those are the ways that I think that you can get the best bang out of your buck by using, you know, LEDs. Um, I think that there's a little bit of a, uh, an issue with the way that they market the spread. Uh, like even with like the, um, you know, the, the smaller puck style LEDs, like they say they'll cover an 18 by 18 or 24 by 24 inch space. But, you know, if you want to get the best usage out of that light, you might want two or three for that amount of space. You want to hang them up. You want to get diffusers on there. Uh, and that's where I've seen, you know, some of the most success uh, with, with LED lights is just the proper application of them. How, um, how high up the, uh, the tank do you have your uh, T5 fixture? See, with this fixture, uh, I might be four to six inches uh, off the surface of the water. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's right there. Um, but that's because this, the footprint of the, the fixture is basically the footprint of where my aquascape is and where my water is. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, obviously the, um, the, the results of the tank or, um, you know, you can, you can certainly see that it's working for the, uh, for the corals and the coloration is just fantastic. And, and, um, yeah, just uh, an outstanding job. I've never done a, uh, a T5, you know, a centric type of lighting over a tank. I've always been, I've been a metal halide, T5 mm -hmm. hybrid. Um, I've had success with that combination, and so with my new tank LEDs, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be using um, six GHL um, Mitras mm -hmm. on that tank, and and so this is going to be my first foray in with the uh, with LEDs, and and I'm I'm certainly looking forward to it. I I, I took some par measurements, and uh, you know with with the um, light, you know the intensity cranked up pretty good there. I was getting four to five hundred, you know, like at the bottom of um, mm -hmm. of the tank and and um close to 600 near the uh the top of my uh rock structure so i i cranked it down a little bit and you know it's it's um uh, it's interesting with with leds there's just so much um you know so many things that you can do to the uh to the light that i'm not used to it's like with t5s and metal halides it's, it's essentially mm -hmm. you're, you're just plug and play and yep. you don't worry about um you know adjusting the intensity you don't worry about it playing with the spectrum so that's that's something that um is different for me and um you know i, I find that um to be very tempting and and uh I've, I've heard some stories where people just really tinker too much with with leds and that can cause issues yeah i mean tinkering is is probably one of the worst things you can do with with any aspect of your reef tank i mean these are animals that can ad adapt to many different situations, many different environments, but you have to give them time to adapt and then you have to let them stay in that environment once they've adapted. So, you know, pick a spectrum you like and stick with it, you know, pick a, a, a par value that you like and, and stick with it. You know, same with any piece of equipment, uh, in the reef tank. Um, just don't fiddle with it too much because just eventually, you know, the corals just tend to get stressed out. And that's something that I had a real issue with when I did, I did LEDs on, on some of my past tanks. Uh, and I was, I was changing them every couple of days just because I, I read something new. I'm like, okay, well let's try this. Or, you know, ah, it just doesn't look just as white as I like it. And I think that was one of my big issues uh, with LEDs was I, I tinker too much. So I prefer to choose options that don't allow me to tinker. That's a good policy to follow there. I would, I would say what, um, what, what do you believe in terms of coral foods? Do you dose like aminos? Do you, um, do you lean on uh, coral, coral food for your, for your tank or do you just really rely on replenishing the trace elements with the water changes? 
I am, I mean, I'm a fish feeder. Um, I like to just take care of all the nutrition uh, through the fish. I don't really get into any of the coral foods. Um, I mean, I add a little pinch of refroids into my frozen mix. Um, I don't really do any amino acids or anything like that or any liquid coral foods. Um, I honestly think that the corals get basically everything they need just from the light uh, and from, you know, what's all contained in the fish waste. Uh, so I'd much rather see, you know, hat, you know, fat, happy fish, um, and not really bother with feeding the coral too much. I have tried it, uh, in the past. I went through a, a pretty decent period of time, uh, on my old 150 every single night after the lights are out, check the polyps, mix up the, all the different feeds, different amino acids, throw it in there. I pipette each individual coral. I just never saw anything from it and I never saw anything negative when I stopped. So I figured, you know, cause at that point I was still feeding my fish excessively. So it might be something that, that works well for people in a tank with not a lot of fish or they don't feed their fish very often. Those corals can benefit uh, from the nutrition, but in my, you know, reefing style, I don't really get any benefit from it. What's in the, uh, the homemade food? Uh, I mean, it's, it's all commercial stuff that's thrown together. I really like the, uh, Hikari stuff, but I do, um, I do mysis. I do the spirulina brine shrimp. I do the omega brine shrimp, ocean plankton. Uh, I do the coral gumbo. I do, um, the krill. I do the, uh, Arctic cyclops. Um, and then sometimes I throw a little bit of, um, Oh God, Rod's food, uh, in there as yeah. well. If I, if I can get a hold of that. Um, so it, it's just a mix of a ton of different things, but I like to cover all the nutritional aspects of everything. I like to carry or cover all of the, um, the particle sizes as best I can. Um, because there's other mouths in the tank, you know, my shrimp go nuts every time I feed, there's other filter feeders in the tank. So like, I just want to make sure I cover all my bases and make sure the tank as a whole is kind of fed. And it's really been something that's uh, worked out well. So um, let's talk about tank automation and controllers. What are your thoughts on, on tank automation controllers and, and other types of equipment? There's a lot of equipment out there to help run a reef tank. What are your thoughts on all, all that stuff? Uh, so at the risk of, um, copyright trademark all that jazz um i'm gonna steal the jake adams line because i really liked it um i'm the controller um that's something that i really uh, like to stick to i like to be the one who is taking care of all the different aspects of the tank because i feel like i'm just personally more in tuned with it um and i know when things are looking off and all that um i like i like to use them as monitors um i think that they are fantastic for giving you just a deeper insight uh into the tank um and seeing how things are changing um and just giving you just that that stronger window um i don't like to rely too much on automation in general just because you know the more points of failure that you put into a tank the easier it is for certain things to go wrong um but I mean, like I like the apexes. Um, I don't have one currently on this tank, but um, there's features of it that I would absolutely use. Um, again, like I like the uh, the Trident. Um, I would still do my own manual testing every week, but if I can watch the, you know, the way the parameters change over a 24-hour period, I think that would be really great. Um, and also, I like the built-in timers. Um, that level of control. Um, obviously, right now I have like those those big box uh timers that you have to you know, set you know each little digit uh manually so i like that aspect of it but i would never rely too heavily uh on a monitor or a controller yeah you know it um it's it's tough it, it can it, you know it can backfire on you and um i think you know like you talked about it's good to be able to monitor and it's good to be able to uh tell if there is an issue with the tank you know i like um having the uh, the text and email alerts if there's certain parameters are out of whack or if the power mm -hmm. is out. Those are great things to be able to have to kind of give you a heads up that there might be trouble going on with the tank. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, you know, I have the, uh, the cage director and, and uh, on, mm -hmm. on both my tanks. So I've, I've kind of gone back and forth in terms of using the cage director as a controller to control the alkalinity mm -hmm. that's dosed. And, uh, I mean, it's great. Listen, it's, 
it's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, um, you know, especially I think it's easier with the, uh, you know, when you use, when you're dosing to, um, to kind of mm -hmm. control it because with a calcium reactor, it just takes a little bit longer to react in terms of what you're getting in terms of readings and then, uh, making the adjustments with the calcium reactor. But, um, you know, you could really lock in in terms of the DKH, but what, what I like to do in terms of not controlling it is, um, I, you know, I like to walk by and kind of look at the, uh, the display screen and see what the, uh, the DKH is on a daily basis. And, and, um, you know, if I see it dropping a little bit every day, then I know things are good with the tank. But if I have the KH director controlling the dosing on the alkalinity, then I, I don't know just by walking by that monitor in terms of what's going on with the tank, if, if it's, mm -hmm. you know, consuming more alkalinity or if it's not, obviously if I just went into the app and looked at the data, then, then I would know that answer, but I'm a little, little lazy in that regard. Yeah, but I, mean, I can see that going two ways, you know, so you, you don't know what the changes are, are happening inside your tank. So that's obviously one thing to think about, but then also what if you're getting, you know, what if the, the reader is not correct and you think it's at seven, but in fact it's set at six or it's measuring uh, seven, but it's actually six and it's keeping it at that level. You don't know that because you trust the machine, you know, so I can see it going both ways with that. And that's why I like it as I would like it as a monitor and then still rely on my normal methods to confirm it uh, rather than let it control something as important as alkalinity. So um, I want to talk about, you know, the Ocean Discovery Visitor Center tanks. But before we do that, anything else that um, you wanted to mention about your your personal tank that we haven't um, touched on? Um, I think we covered uh, most of the things that, you know, I, I, I really feel are important in, in my particular tank. I mean, just as a quick, you know, like wrap up, like my major philosophies for this tank are, simplicity stability i like full spectrum lighting i like lots of fish food with lower nutrients good strong flow and i think diversity is important so um you know if you don't want to wait for it you can get uh live rock if you want to use dry rock find ways to you know include it early uh in the tank's life and that way you'll kind of get to that maturation point a little bit quicker but I think we covered most of the uh, the meat and potatoes of this tank. Yeah, no, I like it. You you have um, I think you have some some old school uh, philosophies and and that you that you put into practice, and it's kind of good to see you know somebody on, on the uh, the younger side of the uh, the age spectrum um, putting those old school philosophies to to use and and seeing that uh, yes, they do still work. And, and yes they work they're they're not outdated they're not you know there's nothing wrong with these methods in fact they're i think they're simpler uh it's a quicker and easier way to achieve results than trying to get mixed up with a lot of these newer newer trends so simulated reality is wondering whether you have a single favorite coral in your tank oh man um depends on the day i think um it's really, really tough to tell uh, a favorite in this particular tank, um, just because I have reasons for 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 all of them. Um, but uh, and I'm really bad with favorites, uh, so I think I will. I'll, I'll give my top. I don't know. I'll give you a couple, just because. Um, I like the uh, the bubblegum digi, just because it, I think it's one of the nicer digis. Uh, the pink bird's nest is really nice because of just how bright pink it is and how great it looks, um, and I just like the growth form. Uh, and then I have um, a spathulata in there that has not quite given me the magical colors just yet, uh, but it is very, very fuzzy, which I like, and it's starting to get um, a little pink on the inside, blue on the outside, so I think it's it's starting to look real nice. Uh, and then there's one acro that I've had now um, for just about eight years that's made it through the crashes and everything. Uh, and it's just a deep purple, uh, acro that I really like. So there, yeah, that's my attempt on favorites. <laughs> so, uh, prime mover. Yeah. We, uh, we talked about this in terms of does Brandon dose aminos or anything else like KZ products. He's pretty much relies on, um, fish poop is, uh, kind of like where we land right? 
Yeah, um, I'll be honest. I tried the KZ stuff uh, for a while um, on this tank in particular. Uh, and I mean, by try it, I mean like I, I tried all the supplements and like the, the one thing I couldn't have was a reactor. Uh, so I just put the media in a media bag. Um, but it's just one of those things that it's not my style. So every night putting 15 different bottles of stuff into the tank, uh, counting drops, like that's not my, my reefing style. And honestly, I didn't see anything from it. And when I stopped, I didn't see any drawbacks to it. So I think I was doing enough right for it to not really matter in my particular system. I know they make great stuff, um, but it's just not for me. Yeah, Alex is commenting, and I think this is a comment about just your overall tank. It's simple, stable, and efficient. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good summary of it. <laughs> so um, let's let's get into the. Uh, I'm going to start rolling the video for the um, the visitor center tanks. And um, yeah, Brandon, why don't you kind of um, talk about your role in terms of those tanks? Did you help set them up? Did you set them up? Or are you pretty much the guy that uh, is maintaining the tanks? Give us a little uh, yeah. lowdown on that. So I'll just give you guys just the quick. Uh, the quick spiel uh, for the whole thing. Um, so for those of you who may not be aware, um, I work at Florida Atlantic University at one of their campuses. Uh, it's called Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. So uh, it's one of the six campuses and it is all focused on um, marine biology research, marine oceanography, uh, marine engineering. So completely and totally all about uh, the marine environment. And so I started uh, there as a student in a couple of different uh, positions back in 2015. Uh, and just about that same time, uh, my friend who was just finishing her PhD there uh, got offered the position to handle and run all of our outreach programs. And one of those programs is the visitor center. Uh, so we have this building on campus where the public can come and see uh, and learn about the research that we're doing uh, because the campus is closed uh, since it's, it's like a research uh, facility. And so we uh, we got to talking and I'm like, hey, I, I, you know, I like uh, fish tanks. You know, it's my hobby. Uh, and so we decided let's put a couple in. Uh, and so we started pretty basic uh, with a few different uh, fish tanks. And then the one you're seeing right now uh, is kind of the, the crown jewel, uh, in my opinion, of the reef tank. So it is um, a Caribbean reef. Uh, and this was kind of a just a, a dream that came true. Um, after about two years of, of being there, I had set up some of these smaller tanks. Uh, and we're like, can we do a Caribbean tank? Like, can we get the coral? Can we get the supplies? Um, and so I decided to reach out to a couple of companies, uh, and I, I feel like they, they deserve a shout out here um, because we got over half the tank either donated or discounted um, because we're an educational facility. Uh, facility. So uh, Marine Land helped, Carib Sea helped, uh, Ecotech Marine, Sugar Systems, uh, Sumps. Uh, so they all gave us uh, contributions towards the tank, and we put together this 180 gallon uh, Florida reef tank. And then we worked with some of our collaborators uh, to get a hold of the coral. And now we have just an awesome uh, reef tank with staghorn, elk horn. Uh, we have uh, montastria in there as well. Uh, and then a really cool one we have an encrusting parietes uh, in that tank. And one day it just decided that it was going to do polyp bailout. Uh, and now the entire tank is covered. I mean, there must be over a hundred colonies of this parietes covering all of the rock work. Um, uh, and the other tank that you're probably seeing right now is, um, a, an, o an ORA tank. Uh, so oceans, reefs, and aquariums is located on our campus. Uh, they're their own private company, but they do lease land from us. Uh, and so we got with them and we said, hey, do you guys want to sponsor a display to showcase all your cool work uh, at the visitor center? And they said, yes. Uh, so we put together a 120 gallon tank with uh, completely everything aquacultured, uh, coral and fish from ORA. So that's a really cool display uh, as well and shows um, the ability of, of having a sustainable reef tank. Uh, and then we also have a seagrass lagoon. Uh, I'm not sure if that popped up yet or not. Um, so that shows three different local seagrasses to us uh, here uh, along the coast. So we have the Indian River Lagoon, which is a really uh, diverse estuary. So we have the three most common types of seagrass growing there. 
Uh, and then we have a sponge and gorgonian uh, reef because we have biomedical researchers who look at uh, getting anti-cancer compounds and new antibiotics from uh, deep sea sponges. And then we also have a, uh, an aquaculture display. Uh, and so outside in our aquaculture pavilion, we have a 700-gallon uh, system uh, It's recirculating. So we have redfish uh, in one tank. Uh, and it functions basically sim uh, very similar to the way like our typical aquariums do, uh, where we have bacteria filter the water and then followed by the different types of plants. So we have um, various marsh plants uh, and mangroves that filter our water. And then we also have a couple of macro algaes as well. Uh, and then some inverts and then clean water goes back to the fish. And so it's a demonstration on sustainable and environmentally friendly aquaculture. Really cool. Thanks. Just a fantastic job. Uh, Alex is wondering what lights are over the Caribbean system. That uh, tank has three Radeon um, Gen 4 XR30s. Uh, they are mounted up at, I think, like 15 inches. Uh, and they're all run um, for 100% all the channels. Uh, and then six T5s, 60-inch uh, T5 bulbs. Uh, and they are all the 6,500K tropic bulbs. Uh, and so that's a tank that cranks over 1,000 par at the surface wow. of the water. Wow. And those stags, they love it. I mean, they they are growing out of the water. I have to get in there and frag them, but uh, wow. yeah, they are literally coming out of the water. Yeah, no, that's impressive. So, I mean, are you you kind of like following the same philosophies with those tanks as your personal tank? Uh, for the reef tanks, yeah. Um, the other ones that are a little bit different, um, I, I do some different things. But for the reef tanks, yeah, I, I follow um, pretty much the same mentality. I like to keep the nutrients low. I like to keep the fish uh, fed. They also have the same, same auto feeders four times a day plus, plus frozen every day um, with a decent fish load. Um, the big Caribbean tank has a real big refugium uh, down on the bottom as well. So, yeah, very, very similar mentalities uh, on keeping those tanks. Well, I, you know, one question I didn't ask you about your um, your personal tank, and, and, and this applies for the uh, for the tanks, you know, at the visitor center as well. But, um, you know, if you ever do have any problematic algae that pops up, what, what are your philosophies in terms of treating it? Do you use chemicals uh, I, or do you just uh, are you more of a, a natural means to try to eradicate it? I'm, I'm very much natural means. I try to avoid any of the chemicals. Um, as best I can, just because I know they're not that selective. Uh, so I know if it's going to treat cyanobacteria, it's going to kill other bacteria as well. I don't want that. Um, so I try to do whatever I can naturally. Uh, the refugiums really helped with that. Stability has really helped, but I do my best to keep a pretty diverse uh, cleanup crew uh, in a lot of these tanks. Um, so, I mean, I, I really like urchins. Um, I really like uh, the maroon, um, no, not the maroons, the um, Mexican red leg hermits. Um, I think they're, and they're kind of brown, but um, I think those are really great. Um, and then in a Pacific tank, I don't have them in the Caribbean tank, obviously, but I really like the trochus, the banded trochus snails. Um, I feel like they really mow, mow stuff down pretty well and they can flip themselves, which is really nice. What about bryopsis? Have you ever run into uh, bryopsis? I got a wood. This is real wood. Um, <laughs> one time, uh, one time I had a small patch of bryopsis. It was in uh, my 14 gallon bio cube many, many, many years ago. Um, and I, I had done a bunch of reading and I had read up on magnesium, um, higher magnesium being a potential deterrent uh, for it. So it was kind of at the surface. And so I went full nuclear. Uh, I drained during a water change just below the bryopsis. I pulled as much of it as I could out and I measured out how much magnesium it would take to bump me up to, you know, about 1500. And I just poured that directly on top of that spot and let it sit for a few minutes. And I have never had it again. So really? knock on wood. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I've heard, you know, people, um, I've tried that before years ago in terms of trying to like bump up the magnesium, but, um, I think sometimes you, uh, you run into more trouble if you go like higher than the 1500. I've, I've read that mm -hmm. sometimes you, uh, you know, it's, it's necessary to go even much higher than that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's interesting in terms of using chemicals versus natural means. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I've always been hesitant to, to do that as well. It, um, I, I just don't like messing with the, uh, with the bacteria, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, you know, we've talked about it on this show as well in terms of there being good bacteria and, and, and bad bacteria. What, um, 
is that something that uh, you know you you um, um, address in your tanks? Is is that something you're concerned with? Do you run tests to 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 see if there is an issue with the tank? If it's a uh, a bad versus good bacteria type of problem? Well, I will uh, give you a little disclaimer here. My master's was in marine microbiology, uh, so I. Uh, I think about bacteria a little bit differently. Um, I think most of the issues that we run into uh, with bacteria in, our, in terms of our reef tanks, uh, it just tends to be more opportunistic, uh, in my opinion. Um, I don't think we necessarily get a ton of like designated coral pathogens that are going to just instantly come in uh, and like wipe out uh, the tank. So I think most of these these bacterial issues come about in response to um, just another problem uh, in the tank, uh, whether it be, you know, a chemical swing or whether it be uh, something to do with DO or temperature getting too high. I think other thing, uh, damage to a coral, I've had that happen before as well. Um, and I really just think that it's more of a response um, to those things. And just because those bacteria are there, uh, it's another big thing, doesn't mean that they are actually causing a problem uh, or that they're the ones responsible for the problem you're seeing. Um, so my approach to it is keep a diverse tank. Uh, so as much biodiversity as you can put into the tank, that's just going to help out compete all sorts of problem organisms, whether it be bacteria, algae, the more diverse the system is, uh, the more mature it is, the easier it is for other, um, or the, the harder it is for other organisms to take over. And so uh, aside from that and, and just keeping a real diverse system, I try to keep the animals just as healthy uh, and as stress-free as I can, which means not a lot of changes, which means, you know, in my opinion, what the optimal parameters are, whatever I can do to keep the immune system of the animal, you know, strong, I think is, is just the best approach to dealing with problematic uh, bacterial infections and things like that. What about quarantining, you know, for your personal tanks and the tanks at the, um, the visitor center? What, um, what do you do in terms of when you bring new corals in? Do you, um, is it do you dip do you um observe them for um you know uh, a little while before you put them in your system obviously you've got a 40 gallon tank at, you know at, at home there and uh, i don't know if you have a quarantine tank but you know what are your thoughts in terms of pests and, and trying to keep them out of a, a system i think when you can do it you should do it um here at home, I will, I will be honest. I don't quarantine the fish. I don't really have another setup going uh, right now to do that. Uh, every coral gets dipped uh, when it goes into the tank. Um, and I mean, obviously you, you can only see so many things. So I, I do a visual inspection, but I also, um, I dip the coral uh, sometimes two or three times um, just to really make sure that I knock off whatever I can. Uh, and I kind of just hope for the best after that. Um, but the other thing that I take into account is the source of where I'm getting the stuff from. Uh, so if I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a coral from, you know, a reputable company, uh, you know, aquaculture company, I'm going to put a, a certain amount of trust into them that they take their precautions seriously. And of course, I'm still going to dip that very same coral. Um, but I feel better getting a, a coral or a fish from a place like that than if you go to a, a local fish store and you see, well, okay, they've got bubble algae on their frags or, you know, that fish is sick, you know, so I take those things into account as well. Uh, the stuff at work, uh, is a little bit more rigorous. I do quarantine all the fish and everything that goes into those systems. Uh, and I do, um, some pretty significant dips, um, there as well on the coral, uh, especially with the Caribbean tank. Um, because for anybody who doesn't know, uh, there is the stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, that has been going through, um, uh, Florida and the Caribbean. Uh, and so, Obviously, we don't get any wild hard corals in, but anytime I've ordered uh, a gorgonian uh, or, or any kind of a mushroom coral, um, I'm very careful with them as well, uh, just just in case. And there's um, a big 65 watt UV sterilizer on that tank as well, uh, just to make sure that we don't get anything funky uh, into that system. What what kind of um, coral dips do you use? Uh, I've used a couple of different ones. I've used uh, Revive. I've used um, I forget the names, but the two, the two Brightwell ones, um, why is it escaping me? Whatever the Brightwell, uh, dips are, they have two. Um, 
I think they have like the super concentrated version, uh, and then they have their their like coral cleaner. Uh, and I've used them both. I've I've done them um, kind of in like a two step process uh, where I do the dip uh, to remove stuff, and then I do the clean uh, afterwards. And it seemed to it, it seems to work out pretty well. So um, Paula Pal has a question. We 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 touched on this a little bit um, before, but um, in in terms of your um, nitrates being pretty low and your phosphates. Uh, the question is, what do you consider to be your um, your optimal parameters? And I don't think we we talked about um, alkalinity. Yeah, I I like the natural seawater levels uh, as best as I can keep them. Uh, so I keep my calcium about 420, 4, 420 to four forty. Um, alkalinity I like to keep seven three seven five. Um, magnesium thirteen fifty or so. Uh, I check potassium weekly. I like to keep that at around four hundred. Uh, and then nitrate was 0.2, phosphate was 0.03, uh, salinity 35, 36 parts per thousand. And then um, I really, really, really try as hard as I can to keep uh, between 8.1 to 8.4 on the pH. I really I try not to tend uh, too low below the eights just because I can very clearly see it uh, in my growth. Do you uh, utilize ICP testing? I've done it. Um, I like, again, it's another one of those things. I like the concept uh, behind it. Um, it's a really good window into what's happening into the tank. I've sent them out. Um, I sent one out in this tank maybe maybe six months uh, to a year ago. I sent uh, a few out to the ones at work. And it gives me a good perspective as to what's kind of working and what's not. Um, but if it turns out that things are off, the, my question is, well, what do you, what do, you do with that? Uh, are you going to, you know, go the, the mad scientist route and start adding all those things to the tank, uh, up your water change schedule? Like what's, you, what's the follow up? Um, so for me, I, I like to see every, every six months to a year, uh, just if things are still good. Um, this tank, everything was in within range last time I sent it. And it's because I'm rigorous with my, my water change schedule. So that proves to me that the, the products I'm using and the maintenance uh, rhythm that I'm using is working. Um, but you know, sometimes you find some deficiencies and, you know, if they're one of the major things, I, I feel like it's worth addressing. Um, you know, if you don't regularly test your potassium and you send it an ICP and it comes back at 280, I mean, I think that's something worth addressing, but if, I don't know, what do they test for like cobalt or something mm -hmm. is, is, is high or low or, or, you know, I'm not really gonna, if things are happy and things are growing and they're colorful, I'm not going to mess around with any of those, uh, you know, minor trace elements. Pal, uh, Paula Pal is wondering what salt you use. I really like the uh, Tropic Marin um, Pro uh, Reef Salt. Um, I think it mixes well, but the big thing for me is I would, because I do five gallons every week, I want to match uh, the parameters of the salt to what I keep my tank. Uh, and they, they have that salt run at just about natural uh, seawater levels. So that's why I really like it, um, just because there's really no swings when I do uh, a water change. I like that salt a lot, too. I used to use it all the time for my uh, my prior tanks, but um, I switched to Instant Ocean just because it, uh, it's saving me some, some bucks right now. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not, uh, as expensive as Tropic Mary. And I think it was also kind of hard to, to, to find at one point, um, within the last year yeah, or two, I think, right? I think, I think people are still having trouble finding it. Um, I usually get, um, I mean, obviously the, the, the bucket that I get lasts this tank for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got two buckets last time cause I anticipated some issues. Uh, and I've heard that, that some people are having trouble, uh, getting a hold of it. Uh, I hope that doesn't continue. I mean, I still have several months of salt left, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, like I mentioned earlier, I think that's why I switched from the, the ESV Bionic over to the BRS because I was towards the end of my jugs and I didn't have anything and I'm like, oh, I gotta do something. So that's, yeah, that's what I wound the, up with. The ESV has been kind of hard to come by. I cannot find the, um, the big, um, what are the eight gallon, um, mm -hmm. um, um, buckets that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, used to, used to, you know, you can save some money versus the, uh, the, the one gallon uh, jugs so yep. yeah that's that's been tough to come by what um random so what what does a dream tank for you look like oh man this was a question on the uh, reef of the month article uh, and i said something at the end like i can tell you a bunch of specifics about the tank and what i want but i can't 
tell you any of the details. Um, I want to tank. It's it's going to depend on like where I'm at and like the dimension wise and all that. But the things that I really want to see uh, in a dream tank are I want more depth to the tank from front to back. I really like to build, uh, you know, a gradual increase in, in my aquascape. And I want to be able to have like some islands uh, out and about. So I don't want to be that rock wall kind of tank. I want all that space um, to build a nice aquascape. Um, I want to see... 99% uh, SPS, uh, majority acros. Uh, I want to do like pretty much full on uh, acro tank um, with a very few exceptions. Like I, I probably put a, another bubblegum digi uh, or a forest fire in there. Uh, and I would have a little Zoa Island completely off to the side away from all the other rocks um, just for, you know, a little bit of extra fun in there. But um, the big thing for the, for a, a dream tank for me is going to be the stocking of it. Um, so I want a handful, not a lot of big colonies. I want, you know, I want to grow them to, you know, a foot and a half, two feet across. Uh, and I want some of the OG classic ones. Um, I want like the red planet, the Bali Slimer. I want a bonsai, I want an Oregon tort. Like I want those corals, uh, in this tank and I want to be able to see them, you know, across the room when I'm making dinner, you know? So uh, that in terms of corals is what I want for fish. Uh, like I said, I want a peaceful tank. Um, I really want to keep some of the, the fairy and the flasher wrasses. Um, I really, really like them and I, I haven't had a ton of opportunity to keep them. Uh, I like Antheus as well. Uh, I'd like to have some shoaling fish, uh, if I can get away with that. I know, I know it's very, very hit or miss and lots of people have issues with it, but, um, I would like that kind of an aspect, uh, in the tank as well. And like I said, I'd probably go T5 LED hybrid as well. Well, you know, I, uh, I hope you get there sooner rather than later in terms of that, uh, that dream, dream tank. You are a, a very impressive reef keeper there, uh, Brandon and, and, um, I, th Thank you. I really appreciate you uh, you joining us tonight for the uh, for the live stream. Any uh, any final thoughts before we we do a wrap on this? Um, I think I probably covered most of it. Uh, but if I were to reiterate anything, um, is when you're thinking about your problems and you're thinking about what you want to see in your reef tank, think about you know how are you going to keep it stable? How are you going to um, maintain it is it going to be manageable for you you know you want something that's going to fit your lifestyle what your goals are uh for the tank try to keep it as simple as you can it doesn't need to be an overcomplicated hobby um and then be patient um i've i i i'm a i'm an impatient person at times and i have definitely made some decisions in this reef tank that i wish i had never made just because i was being impatient with it um so the more patient you can be, the more your reef tank is going to reward you. So if you can keep those things in mind, I think a, a lot of people will be really happy with their tanks. Patience is a really, really important part of reef keeping, and I couldn't agree more. And you, um, uh, you, you got to just kind of sit back and sometimes not overreact and and um, try to like um, you know stress out about certain things. Just kind of let 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 uh, let things fall where they may in in some instances and and. Uh, yeah, don't freak out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, Brandon, man, thank you uh, so much for for being a guest on the uh, on the live stream tonight. And um, and uh, you know, I I, I want to remind folks. Actually, my next live stream is going to be this Saturday at three p.m. I'm having a um, a live coral show featuring. Geez, my 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 tank is just so chock full of corals that I had to go kind of crazy fragging and uh, I'm, I'm pulling up a video of it right now that uh, that should be coming across the live stream so I um, I just had to really clear out a lot of space and and do a ton of fragging there's a two foot long Cali tort in there and nice. you can also see the uh, the Oregon uh, blue tort but um, yeah so I'm I'm doing a um, a live coral show and and selling some of those uh those frags so i hope um you folks join me on on saturday at 3 p.m uh, i'm gonna have a good time with it sit back i'm gonna have a beer do some q a while we're doing the uh the live show so uh yeah it should be a good time and in terms of uh the next wrapping with reef bum that's gonna be next thursday at uh at 7 p.m on march 18th and i'm gonna have remy from uh bahama llama coral on 
So um, that should be another uh, great, great show. Looking forward to it. Anyway, folks, thanks again, uh, Brandon, for being on. And um, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, great conversation. We'd love to have you back on. So uh, that'll do it for this uh, this episode. Anytime. Yep. Be safe, be well, and we will see you next time.